really find the divine in water. And the woods is where I find the divine for me. It's a, it's a great place to just connect. I see him, see him in my wife. My wife shows me a lot of God through her actions. So. Watching a gorgeous sunset. I see a lot of it in nature. I do a lot of walking. When people are at their best, <laughs> yeah. I see divine in the world, yeah. Yeah, like my grandma, I can see it in her. I guess I find more divinity in nature than I do in anything else. Hi, welcome to In Search of the Divine. I'm Ann Thompson and this is my friend Georgie. We're here at St. Mary's of the Woods in Indiana and today we're going to learn about alpacas, we're going to talk about what goes on behind fences, and a whole lot more. So stay tuned. About five miles northwest of Terre Haute, Indiana, is St. Mary of the Woods, home to the Sisters of Providence and several of their ministries, including the White Violet Center for Echo Justice and a herd of alpaca. Alpacas are very, what shall I say, if you watch them as they move around here, they're pretty placid animals. Uh, if you are calm and you are quiet, um, then you can move amidst them pretty easily. Uh, it's only sharp noises and um, uh, quick movements that will scare them, but they can scare easily. Um, they're also pretty, uh, they're low-key animals. They're not, they're not violent, they're not really aggressive. Um, they have a, which, what can I call it, Georgie? What can I say about you? It's, it's kind of a happiness yeah. with themselves. Um, that I often send, um, I often send people out when I'm giving a, re a private retreat. I often send people out to sit and watch the alpacas um, because they have a calming effect, uh, and they're pretty, they're pretty just happy with themselves, and they go about their daily life, um, and they don't cause. They're nonviolent, and they don't really cause difficulties or upset for the most for the most part and I think that's an excellent piece that they have to teach us as humans. Where's Claire? Right here, this is Claire. Claire was born uh, on the Feast of St. Francis, uh, 15 minutes apart from a little white boy and of course he got named Francis. So we have Francis and Claire who celebrate their birthday on the 4th of October. Remember St. Francis? He would have loved these gentle creatures. Anyway, before we go to our next story, I'd like to tell you just a bit about this Catholic saint who became famous for his love of animals and peace. Francis of Assisi was born in Italy in the late 1100s to a wealthy merchant. As a kid, Francis was a full-throttle cut-up who enjoyed life to the hilt. In his early 20s, his adventures landed him in prison. During his year-long incarceration, he experienced a bit of a conversion, although it would be a while before the full extent of those changes set in and he would become one very impressive mystic who relished peace and poverty. It's said that he even asked to be buried on a hill outside his hometown where criminals were executed. Enough about Francis of Assisi. After this quick break, we'll tell you about a modern day Francis who prefers to be called Frank. in a name? Perhaps more than we realize. Let's put it this way, I wasn't an angel as a youngster. I, uh, I've had my days in the principal's office and uh, got into a few tussles. Not unlike St. Francis, Frank had his share of issues in his youth, even having a few scrapes with the law. I think uh, what helped me have some insight and some rapport and understanding of offenders was the fact that 
I grew up poor, and I grew up in uh, situations that uh, exposed me to uh, the culture and the client uh, that we later worked with. And so I had no trouble relating to somebody uh, who was an offender because I, for the grace of God, could have been one as well as many of my young friends could have been as well. Frank whose impressive career included serving in Minnesota as warden at two of the state's most high security prisons and commissioner of corrections, knows that his spirituality has changed as a result of his work. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's changed in that I think I'm better able to see in the face of an inmate or a poor person or somebody that's uh, disenfranchised, uh, I'm able to see uh, the Creator there, and that uh, he has the same concern for them that he has for those people who seem to be successful in society. Um, and uh, he himself was in prison, uh, and uh, unjustifiably in prison. And his life was taken, capital punishment unjustifiably. Highly respected as a tough and often demanding manager, the now retired commissioner changed the face of corrections in Minnesota and beyond, and his opinions are unwavering. The reality is that people that are incarcerated are people much like the people you and I encounter every day. They are somebody's father, brother, mother, sister, cousin, uncle, um, and uh, they made some poor choices. They made some poor decisions. Um, many of them made those decisions while they were under the influence of some chemical or drug or alcohol or something. That's not to excuse their behavior, but it's to point out that, but for the grace of God, we all had the potential. And as long as you're still a living vertical human being, you still have the potential. Your life isn't over yet being put in a set of circumstances that cause you to do something that's inconsistent with your good judgment, principles, and your values. Like his namesake, Frank Wood turned out far differently than his early years may have suggested. His unceasing commitment to the disenfranchised, though not always easy, is steeped in a compassionate respect for and commitment to peace. When I was young, I was impulsive, and uh, it wouldn't take much to trigger me. Uh, now I think I have a little more restraint, even in the face of extreme provocation, that I, I wouldn't have had even 30 years ago. One of the things that was said at my 20-year class reunion, we always thought Frank would end up in prison, but not as the warden. <laughs> Welcome back to our Search for the Divine with Sister PB and the alpaca. Right now you are seeing them shorn. Oh, Athena. There, you want some noises? Uh, no, be nice. Um, alpacas are, uh, come from the high desert regions of South America. So they can handle cold pretty well. Um, but it's humidity that's very difficult. And of course, here in Indiana, we have lots of humidity. So when it gets to be the 1st of May, they have a winter coat that's probably about five to six inches long, uh, very, very heavy. And so usually weighs between five and eight pounds. When we shear them and take their fleece off, then the sisters, uh, many of the sisters here go to work and they do, um, they clean the fleece um, and then they begin to uh, cart it, which makes it into long strands. And then we have um, spinners 
who spin it into yarn. Um, and then the yarn is given to other sisters who knit and crochet and weave on looms. Um, and then they make all kinds of products like hats and scarves and, and uh, wall hangings, etc., and felted hats um, that we then sell. And the money that we make from, um, oh, you guys, the money that we make from that pays for their, um, their vet bills and also for their fee. Then we also, all of their droppings um, is gathered every day and taken up to the compost pile and that goes uh, onto our organic gardens. Um, they have some of the best, uh, the best manure of any animal because it, it doesn't have to be uh, cooled. Uh, it, uh, it's, uh, when they drop it, it can go immediately onto the, um, onto the gardens. Right? Yeah. You're pretty good girls, aren't you? If you've spent much time with nuns, you know that they don't really retire. After all, ministry is lifelong. That is true with 95 and a half year old Sister Mary Mark Mahoney. She's been a teacher, a spiritual director, and a census taker. But in retirement, she writes letters. I saw this uh, ad in National Catholic Reporter for uh, people to correspond with prisoners. And, and there were two men, one in St. Quentin on death row, one in, uh, uh, in Leavenworth, Kansas City. I got letters back immediately from both of them. And they both said in the, almost the same words, how could you write to the scum of the earth as people call us? But you know, if it wasn't for my background, I might be right where you are. And that makes them feel comfortable. So I said, um, I just went on to tell them that you know, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, so I know better than you. Um, I, and I just let them know that, you know, I was fine with them. And uh, it gave them the right, the right attitude. Over the years, Sister Mary has corresponded with as many as 50 inmates at one time. Currently, she writes to about 16 men and women across the country, including a young woman named Kelly, who is serving a life sentence for murder. What happened to her was that she had three children, and the fourth one was uh, Hannah. She was two years old. She, was, she had many health problems. She'd need tube feeding and so on. But what happened to her was that she set the bed on fire and Hannah burned to death. Your heart aches for those people. At least mine does. She started to write me. And at first I was like, why does this nun want to write to me? I mean, who would ever want to write to me? I'm this, this big bad murderer. Why would anybody want to care about me? And so she just persistently kept writing and kept writing. And she's a huge reason why I have jumped from like, okay, maybe I'll believe in God today, you know, as long as he's doing something good for me. Um, she just persistently kept writing, and she's, her words, I don't, she, she persistently kept telling me that I'm not alone and that God loves me no matter what, and that she loves me, and, it, and it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful, just as, because in a place like this, you don't always feel like people care about you, even though they might say it. You know, your family might say it. You don't always feel it, but I feel it from her. Well, it's not hard for God, because God understands sin. But he, he, God sees the circumstances. God knows their hearts. And I say, you know, the conversions that take place in those prisons is wonderful. Wonderful. It's easy for me to forgive other people, for the most part, but to forgive myself, ooh, that was really, really hard. I, um, <laughs> for, um, 
It took me until, I've been here since 1997, and it took me until the year 2003 to write to my priest in Hastings and ask him to come out here for a confession. And, um, and I, he came out here, it was May 14th, 2003, and he came out here, and I was just gonna talk to him, I wasn't, and it ended up being a confession, and before that, I, didn't, I don't think I could have ever forgiven myself or then truly forgiven a lot of other people, but after that, um, after my confession with um, Father Jim, it was, enlightening. It was, I felt so much lighter, so much better talking to him. And ever since then, it's easier for me to say, I still beat myself up for everything, but there, but it, I don't beat myself up as bad. And then I remember that May 14th, I remember that. And it, it just, um, it, it just helps a lot. It just um, reminds me that, like, that I'm not any bigger than God that I can't forgive myself. I'm, I, I'm not perfect in my spirituality. I'm not anything but what I do know is that I'm not alone and that God loves me no matter what. And so because I know that, I want to share it. You know, I mean, I just, yeah. And it took me a long time to get there because I had to get past forgiving myself and then forgiving others, but mostly forgiving myself. For people who've been exposed to prison life, from Sister Mary Mark to Kelly, from Frank Wood to St. Francis, there seems to be an understanding that behind the physical and emotional fences that can imprison people, there are profound opportunities for personal growth, insight, and change. After this message, we'll find out how our alpaca friends are a part of a much bigger approach to spirituality. The herd of alpaca we've been visiting today is situated on a lovely, somewhat secluded sanctuary that is home to the Sisters of Providence and several of their ministries, including a women's college and, as I mentioned earlier, the White Violet Center for Echo Justice. Echo Justice, our belief, is the core of all justice because if there is no ecology, uh, there's nothing to be just about. Uh, and so our focus is on uh, right relationship between all of creation. That means that everybody gets to sit at the table. So all I'm creation, I'm animals, plants. The decisions are not made just on what's best for the human. Sister Maureen says that Echo Justice combines issues of ecological sustainability with human justice. These intertwined elements foster a way of living that recognizes the interdependence of all creation. At White Violet, that approach started with the Sisters of Providence and their long-standing commitment to teaching. Well, I'd have to go back to the Sisters of Providence since this is their ministry, and they have been educators their entire life here in the United States and even before in France. So from 1840 on, they have been educators. And back in around the early 90s at uh, an assembly, the question came, what? what do we do with the land? They have 1,200 acres of land here. What was their responsibility? And that's what sort of evolved within them as a community of the, the land ethics. What is their moral responsibility for all of this? And out of that came the concept of White Violet Center that would be the center that would sort of be the, the guiding force for that, that ethics and how it was lived out here on the land. More than just a moral response, the center is rooted in the spirituality of the Providence Sisters and focuses on the preservation, restoration, and reverent use of all natural resources. We try to practice what we preach. So we have uh, certified organic cropland, we have a biodynamic gardener, we raise alpacas, which are very gentle on the land, and uh, we harvest their fiber. 
We do environmental education and we work on several advocacy issues. Besides looking at the overall plant of uh, how we can provide energy, better food, etc. We come out of the Native American sense of seven generations. So what we decide to do, we have to think about how that will affect seven generations from us. And so that we're not just looking at it economically, but also what are we going to leave the next generation or seven generations from now as far as the land, as far as the air, as far as the water is concerned. So all of those things go into decisions that we make. Perhaps it's not surprising, but as a spiritual approach, respect for Earth and all her creations have changed how Sister Maureen and PB connect with the divine. My sense of prayer is no longer praying to, but being a part of. Um, it's a reminder to me of my relationship uh, with the divine, in the divine, surrounded by the divine. So there's not there's not as many compartments, if that makes sense. There's more of a holistic, I mean, prayer is mucking the alpacas as much as it is sitting this afternoon with 20 people giving thanks for the, the garden. So I, I think I'm, I'm more together in one sense than I was before. Big thing for me is that um, I try and live my life now by the whole sense of the universe story and the whole piece of um, the divine is the constant energy that flows around me and within me and through everything and every person and every animal that I'm involved in. So when Georgiana here comes up to me and tries to give me a kiss, that's the divine saying, PB, you are special, you are mine. Um, and when I in turn respond to her with gentleness, then it's the divine saying back to her, I, Georgiana, am special. I stand out in, in the pasture every day and I get to hear the chorus of, of birds singing. And to me, that's, those are hallelujahs being offered up. You know, it's Easter every morning. Thanks for joining us today on In Search of the Divine. And as for the hat, it's from uh, Georgie's sister, Chauncey. We'll see you next time. I suspect that most people that are on death row have burnt all their bridges and probably have nobody that's communicating with them and nobody that even feels like they're able to be redeemed or that they are any good to society. So to have somebody who takes the time to communicate with somebody like that is uh, something that I think will be rewarded in heaven. Um, you know, he, he, he did ask us to look out for the poor and visit people in prison. Alpacas are part of the uh, what we call the camelid family. Um, they're re related to llamas and vicuñas and guanacos. Um, Alpacas have always been raised, they've been around about 5,000 years, um, and they've always been raised only for their fleece, only the kings and queens of the Inca Indians were allowed to wear um, clothing that was made out of alpaca, and so the alpacas were like, they were also considered the sacred animal.